Chris Foss, Brandon Moss, and Derek Gaunt. But today I have a super special treat with my longtime friend, Michael Roderick, who is an entrepreneur based in New York. And I keep thinking about the the people I love and I love spending time with. I remember just a couple of years ago, we we're in New York eating in Chinatown, talking oh. for two, <laughs> three hours. I don't know. I just keep during the pandemic since I'm no, you know, I can't hug you and I can't. I know, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like oh, air hug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What am I supposed to do? And we, you know, out of myself, you, we, we went to next door to get ice cream. I don't know why I just keep re referring back to that moment. And we're sitting there. If you remember those like ice cream that you can make any way with, you know, yes. waffles on top and like crazy yeah. stuff. And that and that room was so tiny, right? <laughs> where where now you think about it, there's absolutely no way you could be in that place ordering that ice cream, right? Yeah. Like in the oh same in the same way that we were. Like now, literally, you're probably one person in there making one ice cream and a big line out the door. You know, yeah. if you know if it's still you know operating in the same in the same way and not just doing delivery, right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't this <laughs> crazy? Things change in a year, in two years. Um, it's wild. Absolutely. Yeah. But that moment just made me think about like how we, you know, uh, uh, Adam first connected us and how we kind of took our friendship and, you know, I interviewed you, you interviewed me and I must, you know, give it a shout out to, to you because since the beginning of the pandemic, you started a group. I was very honored, very lucky to be part of that group and met so many wonderful people. And on top of that, you introduced me to more guests on the show for people who don't know that you know, Jeff Madoff, um, as one of the more recent guests, love talking to him. And yeah. he referred me to even more people within his connections. So that is all to say you practice what you preach and <laughs> you create a community, you share your connection. And I love the message that you bring to this discussion. I think it's so relevant to anyone, to any organizations, how to become more referable and, yeah. you know, memorable and eventually unforgettable. So could you talk to us a little bit about, about that, Michael? I know we started sure. talking about that even before. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So so basically one of the things that uh, has happened, uh, I would say in over the past probably like four or five years, mm -hmm. is that there's been a level of uh, market sophistication that's come into play because tons and tons of people are teaching people marketing. Right. <laughs> so so at the beginning, we didn't really know very much, uh, you know, in the early stages, a lot of er like entrepreneurs didn't really know much about sort of outreach, didn't know much about um, growing their business or building their business. Mm -hmm. And then probably about four or five years ago, there was this proliferation of people who would teach you how to, you know, reach out to people, how to grow your business, how to present yourself. And one of the main drivers of that message was always the idea of the differentiation. The concept that if you stood out, if you were different, then that was what was gonna make you successful. That that was the thing that was gonna just, you know, skyrocket your business. But the problem is so many people started teaching people how to be different, that everyone's different is now starting to sound the same. Hmm. So when you start to look at that, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, how do I still end up standing out, being sort of part of somebody, part of somebody's mind? And what I realized, the more that I would sort of look at the successes of both my clients as well as individuals that I knew, it had to do with the fact that they were being talked about when they weren't in the room in a good way. So it was this aspect of being referable. It was this concept of like, how do we package our ideas so that people are more likely to have conversations with other people about us and about our services without us actually doing anything to, to like to organize it, like tell them to do it, like any of those different types of things. So that's really what got me into um, starting to look at this idea of referability and really paying attention to the idea of like, how do people in the thought leadership world end up becoming so, so well known? So I started to kind of dive into, we've talked in the past about the fact that I am a very big believer in frameworks over formulas, right? I don't wanna tell you how to do something because then you'll sound exactly like me. 
But if I can give you a new way to think about things, then you can bring yourself to the to the process and you can create something that is truly yours as opposed to just a parroting of uh, my system or, or my process. Mm -hmm. The moment you said we all, isn't that magical? Everybody's teaching you the, like you said, the formula and we all sound the same. I think about, I hate to use this metaphor, but it's like all the plastic surgery um, that mm -hmm. was happening, in, especially in Asia and Korea, that everybody pointed at the magazine to say, I want to look like her. And yeah. seriously, there was like a period of of time still today that you look like people post-surgery, they all look identical. And yeah. some people even say, hey, you look more distinctive, like, you know, more memorable before, you know, what's happening. So, yeah. if, <laughs> you know, if we're breaking down, by the way, the audience that we're, uh, that are listening, who are listening to this are as you can imagine, entrepreneurs and um, like you, like me, who are a little bit more conditioned and have more access to this type of, you know, have this conversation nurtured in such a way. But there are also people who haven't been exposed to, um, you know, branding or thinking it through. So if we were to kind of break it down a little bit, like how, mm -hmm. Michael, how would you approach someone without as much background in self-promotion, branding, design development? Sure um to help them understand that yeah so so basically i would use the framework that i use with pretty much uh my even my more sophisticated clients mm -hmm. um as you know because the framework itself is actually a very very simple framework and the way that you want to think about creating a referable brand is you want to think about three concepts and it's easy to remember because it spells the word aim so you want to think about this idea of taking aim when it comes to your brand. So it is accessibility, influence, and memory. So those are the three principles to creating a referable brand. And first, from an accessibility standpoint, the way you wanna think about things is, can people outside of your industry, can people outside of your world understand what it is that you do, hmm. right? Can they get it? Because most of the time, what happens is we fall into what I like to refer to as the echo chamber of the enlightened, where everybody's kind of using the same words and talking about the same thing. So we feel like people get it, mm. but we go outside of our circles what? and it's completely like, what are you talking about? Yeah. What is this? I've never even heard this before. I've never even thought about this before. Mm -hmm. So accessibility uh, in each of these, Faye, is a like, uh, is its own rabbit hole. So we could mm -hmm. go, So, but what I'm going to do just for the purpose of this is I'm going to lightly touch on each and then we can dig deeper into um, into each of them or we can spend more time on one than another, uh, whatever you know, is going it. to be most useful. So mm, love it. moving on from accessibility, we have influence. And what's fascinating about influence is that most of the time we have studied influence in the context of persuasion mainly because there's a lot of material and content and content out there that basically says that if we can persuade others to do things, then that is influence, right? Like if we can use particular psychological tools to get somebody to do something, then that is influence. But what I've seen time and time again with like the most popular memes and, and the most popular forms of entertainment and even like uh, thought leaders and, and books is the fact that the most influential material mm -hmm. is material that we share on our own mm -hmm. we don't get asked to share it we don't have somebody telling us to do anything right. we are motivated by sharing it so the question then is what is that motivation yeah and that motivation is the sharing of it makes us look good mm. so most of the time when we're thinking about a brand we're trying to sort of like prove our value and tell people about our value and what we really should be doing is think about what can I give people? What can I create that they would want to share with other people because it will make them look good. Mm. It'll make them look interesting. Yeah. And that's how the stuff starts to refer back to us. And then finally, memory is a very, very important part of the equation because if somebody can't remember your ideas, uh, it's very, very unlikely that they're going to share them. Mm -hmm. right? It's just, it's going to be too hard. So the way that I like to look at memory is if you want people to remember you more, you focus on less. And that is language, emotion, simplicity, and structure. Mm -hmm. So language has to do with the fact that 
we can create our own language around our offerings and around our ideas. And if people use that language, it becomes the language of a community, right? People then sort of use that language with each other and talk to each other and they're bonded more. And we hold a special part in their memory. Like we actually hold a little piece of real estate because we came up with that word or we came up with that way of saying that word. Mm -hmm. And most people will not do that. Right. Because it's it's hard to sit down and come up with your own your own language. It's much, much easier to just take somebody else's and use it in your work and I in mean, the stuff so that many... you're doing. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. I, I feel yeah, like no, no, go for it. You're like there's a lot of um, echoes that are kind of inside my head thinking about so many other people are doing this. I'm taking notes while recording it. Um, Seth Godin always says emotional labor, dance with fear. He always says yes. people like us do things like this. It feels so good in the gut, right? Like people yep. are like, oh, I do this. Like we go live, people like us do this. Um, yep. But I think about your language, the community that you build, right? Like we have the ask, give, yep. experiment and thank. So, yep. and not only it's a language, it's a system, it's a, it's a framework where in for people who don't haven't checked out Michael's group, it's really about, you know, you want to give something to the community before you ask, you have someone to thank, you know, we constantly thank you, but you always say, thank someone else. Think about someone yeah. who you haven't appreciated in a long time. And I'll never forget. There's one woman, like she hesitated and she's like, I really want to thank the assistant in my office. I don't even get to see her right now. And uh, during the pandemic, I so appreciate her. She's very quiet. And I just want, and she was not even in the room with us. So yeah. And then lately, well, outside of this group, I've been experimenting a lot of things and I finally was able to attach that language to my conversations completely outside of your group. So thank you for that, Michael. Please continue. Sure. We're just talking yeah, about yeah. language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and that's the thing, right? You give people something that is useful for them, right? Like they can go and do something with it. And uh, this, this actually ties to a concept and I'll keep going in a second, but there's a concept that I like to uh, use where as an entrepreneur, you want to give yourself an F. And the idea there is most of the time we're trying to say like, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is we want to say, this is what I do for, right? So we want to think about like, what am I doing for my clients? Give yourself an F, like sit down and say, what am I doing for the people that I'm working with? What am I doing for the community? Because we spend way too much time trying to explain to people what it is that we do and not enough time actually like communicating what we do for mm -hmm. others. And it's a very, very important part of the part of the equation. And when you create something that has that level of utility, you're doing something for other people while also sharing your thought leadership. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing is emotion. Mm -hmm. And what's really, really fascinating about emotion is that emotion basically creates like a sponge uh, in, in our brain. So when we're in heightened states of emotion, we will remember details much, much more easily because in the wild, when, when we were primitive, if we didn't remember that part of the forest where the tiger was, like we were in trouble, right? Like whatever experience we had that was like a heightened emotional experience, our brain suddenly like will sort of just graft onto that, right? But most of the time when people are sharing concepts and ideas of thought leadership, or sharing something about a brand, they don't necessarily tap into emotion. So people will forget the idea. Mm -hmm. And the way that I like to uh, look at this is nobody can actually tell you uh, the details of the opening of the movie Titanic. Mm -hmm. But everybody can tell you the image that they can see if I say I'll never let go. Mm -hmm. Like they can, they can tell you like the exact details of that moment. And think of any film that made you cry, that made you laugh hysterically, like you can pinpoint exact moments. Like you can see all of the details. And that's because your brain is, is basically absorbing details at a higher level mm -hmm. when you are in that heightened state of emotion. So if you're communicating something, if you want people to share it, you want to get them into that heightened state of emotion so that it sticks in their memory, so that it I was stays like with them. Yeah. Right. I realized yeah. the moment I want to raise my hand, it's like Michael used to be a very successful high school teacher and <laughs> yeah. became a Broadway producer in two years. So I was like, question. Um, I, I'm thinking a scenario where when we used to be out in the open, like I live in Boston, I would go to Harvard Yard for years and kids will everybody would get together coffee. 
talk. So what are what's your take on, I guess, two things we have to break it down. One is people have said social media website where people are reading your story, which I often have a visceral connection to really good stories while reading. And then there's the other scenarios like everything's virtual. This is like as close as I, I get to you. So I guess what I'm saying is verbal versus nonverbal emotional attachment or impact. What's your take on that? So I think that there's this concept in acting known as sense memory, uh, where basically what you do is if you're doing a scene and let's say it's a sad scene, rather than, uh, you know, trying to sort of emote, right? Like rather than trying to sort of show that you're sad, you go back to a moment in your own life where you were that sad mm -hmm. and you get yourself kind of worked up enough to feel like you're about to cry and then you do the scene, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're writing your about page, if you are doing a presentation, if you are doing a talk, why not? find some very, very specific details of something that is a heightened emotion for you because that level of vulnerability, no matter what you're doing, even if it's virtual like this, will draw people in mm -hmm. and it'll give them that like it, additional feeling of emotion. And when you're doing that, they're going to A, feel closer to you, but they're going to listen more to the details mm -hmm. of the information that comes after it. Right. They're going to listen more. They're going to pay attention more to those details because of that sponge brain kind of moment. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time what we tend to do is we tend to shy away from the stuff that is hard to talk about, the stuff that is emotional for us, the stuff that would make us cry. Right. Or the stuff uh, or the stuff that we just think is hilarious. Right. And, you know, other people might not think it's hilarious. Like other people might be like, that's actually not very funny, you know, or, or, you know, or. I've heard that or, before. <laughs> yeah. You know, like there's stuff like we, we watch and we think, oh, my God, I, that was like brilliant. And other people will watch and be like, that was really stupid. Yeah. Like that was just not entertaining at all. Oh, uh, maybe you know? I don't want to be friends with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Right. So it's like it's it's that dynamic of it's it's scary for a lot of people to share a part of themselves that is you know vulnerable is used so often so like i you know i i almost hesitate to use it right mm -hmm. uh but when you think about it it's it, when you think about that aspect of like showing a part of yourself mm -hmm. that you know you feel emotion while you're showing that part of yourself well it just connects people to you mm. better like you just feel more connected to somebody mm -hmm. and you know i like a uh, perfect example um my uh my mother uh passed away of cancer about a year ago mm -hmm. and when you sort of have that when you are somebody who has had a parent um pass everybody else in your life who has also had a parent pass you kind of become part of this like like strange club where it's like you're supporting each other and you and you all like understand it on a completely different you know on a completely different level yeah. and you know when you share those things right you help other people understand that they're not alone which i think is probably the most important aspect i think sometimes we get worried that if i share something emotional it's, you know, it's going to be bad for my brand or it's going to be bad for how I look. Um, but in many cases, when we share that emotional thing and we share the stuff that we're going through, there are people out there who are like, wow, I'm not alone. You know, yeah. somebody else is actually talking about that, which mm. I think is really, really powerful. It's super powerful. I certainly... Uh, I've gone through my dad passing when I was uh, in my early 20s. He was sick and then he finally passed away two years later when I was 26. So exactly like you said, Michael, I became, it was awkward because I became one of the first among my friends to experience that. Well, all of us yeah. expect us to go through that in our, I don't know, 40s and 50s. I expected myself to, I'm like, I'll be ready then. And it turns out nobody will be exactly ready to experience that. And so... I, you know, joked around. I said I become, I became the palliative care uh, social worker that everybody came to me and said, "Faye, you would know." And yeah, people whose husband w were dying, it, you know, were all approaching me for this, and that's why, you know, I had, I will save a question for a little bit later in terms of yeah. access and language for palliative care because that's so hugely misunderstood sort of area yeah. in of itself. So. 
I, I love that connection. And because I, I read uh, one of my friends uh, about Paige, I call her friend, her, it's jenkuo.com. And she's an Aust- she's a Chinese um, heritage uh, woman living in Australia. I literally read her about Paige, which was like five miles long. It's like those mega posts. And I couldn't stop reading. And, mm-hmm. you know, we did not cross paths in any sort of way, but she kept saying from agency to feeling out of place to, you know, romantic lives, feeling awkward living in a Western world, it, finding creativity. I'm like, that's me. That's me. That, you know, it yep. was just like, who wrote my story better? <laughs> like, it just in a very weird feeling. Like, you re- really have like a long lost twin on the other side of the world. So, yeah. Thank you. For clarifying that yeah yeah and and what you're bringing up is the fact that that is that level of emotion made her referable because now you're talking about her on this show i just right did. right so she's in your memory she's actually got a piece of real estate in your memory that they, you access whenever you hear things like this mm-hmm. right think about that think about how powerful that is and most of the time, we don't take the time to ever tap into the emotional component, which actually gives people a completely different piece of real estate mm-hmm. in our memory, mm-hmm. like a completely different piece of real estate, uh, an area that maybe a lot of the time we don't talk about or that we don't, you know, that, that, that we don't discuss. So it's always worth it to think about that when you're thinking about creating memory markers for the content and for the material. Uh, mm-hmm. The next piece is simplicity. And what's really, really interesting is that all throughout our lives from academics, we were taught that complexity was the way to go. Like we were taught that if we use the biggest words and if we write the biggest papers, then we're smart, right? And, And what tends to happen is that translates into the business world and into the branding world. We think that if we can use these really big words and we think that if we can come up with these like things that make you feel like, wow, you must really know your stuff that, you know, that's going to help sell us. But the the thing is the memory rewards simplicity Mm -hmm. because there's just too much content. There's too many things to take. Right. So if I said, if I said, okay, I'm going to talk to you about memory and here are 32 different ways that you can become memorable. Mm -hmm it would be lost, right? But by taking it and saying it's language, emotion, simplicity, and structure, and saying focus on, you can basically remember more by focusing on less, Mm -hmm. it makes it very, very easy for you to process. And that ties to the last piece, which is structure. The spelling gives you a structure. It gives you a process to be able to explain that to somebody else without feeling awkward, without like feeling like you can't remember it, without, you know, and, and even if you didn't remember every piece, right, you could mention it and say, oh, I'll look up the other part, but it spells the word less. And you, you wouldn't be embarrassed, right? Like there wouldn't be an aspect of like, I don't really, you know, it's not like I really get it. Like I'm giving you a tool that makes it so that you can share this very, very easily. You can remember it very, very easily because there's a structure there. And that's why jokes have lasted as long as they have, right? That's because there's, everybody knows that you have the, you know, the punchline, you know, the setup and the punchline. Mm -hmm. So they've existed forever. And structure is something that we need for memory. Like we can't remember things if we don't know what comes first, what comes second, what comes third. Like it's, it's too hard. There's too many things. There's a reason why we write lists when we go to the grocery store, right? Because we don't, it, otherwise it's all kind of bouncing around inside of our heads. We need an organizational system. And most people, especially in branding and thought leadership, don't think about that, that organizational system. They don't think, okay, I've got all these great ideas, but how would other people organize it? Mm-hmm. How would they actually be able to process it? And when we look at the people who have really attained very, very high levels of success, they have created structures that they've built entire empires of intellectual property on, Mm -hmm. right? Where they've broken down for us, like, these are the steps. This is the particular, you know, this is the particular process. This is the way that you can, you know, go through this. And any book that you've ever read that, you know, has been in that like business canon where you're just like, wow, that book was really, really helpful you are almost always going to be able to point to a graph that they gave you or a process or a structure Mm -hmm. that basically helps you understand the complex information 
that they're trying to, you know, that basically they're making sure that other people outside of the, their little circle, outside of the echo chamber of the Elaine, actually get. Mm. This is getting so juicy because I was looking at my little notes. I mean, this is literally the size of my notebook right now. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it says aim less, right? Access yeah. influence memory, aim. And then we break down memory, language, emotion, simplicity, structure, structure. So less. And then that's such a positive thing uh, in terms of association because less is more in this yeah. case. And I want yes. to just use myself as a guinea pig because what a sure. what an opportunity because I, I until I've started my company in January 2016. And I think not that I purpose, purposely over made it overly complex, but it's just, you know, when you start out, you're not quite sure exactly what you're doing and you say yes nope. to a lot of things. Yeah. So <laughs> you will not believe this, my guy. Literally, I think last month or maybe two weeks ago, I sat down with myself and I start I start writing on my homepage to say, this is how, you know, this is what I do for my clients in plain English. And mm -hmm. I think I did it around midnight by myself because it was quiet with no distraction. Uh, distraction. I said, at the beginning, I thought to myself, I should be able to explain this to any eight-year-old. So like mm -hmm. literally. And I realized the structure that I always believed in wasn't necessarily some someone else's framework or formula. Mm -hmm. So so I call it the three C's. I think I do remember Jason Van Orden had his like three P's, uh, uh -huh. the platform being one of them. But I said, I think I have the three C's. So mm -hmm. mine is, as you know, I'm a content junkie, not just consuming, but creating so much of it, like film and um, blog posts, videos and, and podcasts, live stream. So I realized my three C's are content, community, and collaboration. Mm. So break it. I, I mean, I, I feel free to please feel free to like say this sucks. Um, so what what happened is content is at the core, like I help my clients create content. And then yeah. community is I notice that by putting a course out there without a community and when it self pays, it's 5% completion rate. Um, people don't feel a sense of community and it doesn't matter how big the community is for people who are watching this. I'm not talking about 10,000 people. I'm talking about five, 10 people completing a course together. I have 120 people in my Facebook group that are thriving together. Michael has 500 or more. Um, mm -hmm. Last piece is collaboration. This to me is a collaboration that my people get to access your content, get to know your work and hopefully hire you to learn from you one-on-one -on -one or through your courses and content. Um, but I also realized the moment that I start to see an uptick uh, in my YouTube channel now has over a hundred thousand unique views per month. Like, Congrats. You said, thank you. Thank you. And it's like a hundred shares, like who is sorry, a thousand shares. Who are yeah. these people sharing my content out um, on their own, uh, you know? And um, so that the level of collaboration in the literal sense, um, people sending me videos and I say, I'll host it on my channel and brands reaching out to me to say, oh, something's working over there. Could you talk about our product, our brand? So I feel yep. like that to me is a triangle. It, you yeah. know, it's not perfect, but I'm just like literally figuring this out and talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there are a couple of different things that are popping to mind for me. Please, yeah. Uh, the first is, uh, what it sounds like is that your work is actually the combination of those three things. Mm -hmm. And it could be very, very interesting for you to explore what does it look like? Uh, and a lot of people have used this particular model, which can sometimes help map it out, which is the Venn diagram, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where you could basically have like, this is the circle for content. This is the circle for collaboration. This is the circle for community. Mm -hmm. And then what is that thing when you bring it all together? Like, what do you call that? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like, what is that result? Um, and then looking at if you only have content and community without collaboration, what is that? And you can yeah. you can actually develop a whole framework that you can sort of show people and communicate to them that it's like these things yeah. uh, all together are what actually make the success happen. So like you can show them like these are where the gaps are. And the other really interesting thing about that is with something like that you can then start to create some sort of evaluation tool for your clients, uh, which really makes for a great uh, like lead magnet, right? Mm -hmm. Where basically people can uh, rate themselves on like what they're doing with their content, what they're doing with community, what they're doing with collaboration, and at the end have a score that helps them understand, oh, I guess I haven't yet 
you mm -hmm. know, uh, achieved what I want to achieve. And it, it motivates them to come to you, right? Like it motivates them to say like, oh, okay, I don't necessarily understand all of these things about myself, or I've kind of seen the areas where I'm falling down. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about how to solve them, right? Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about how to fix it, right? So, so that's the, that's one piece of this, right? The other piece of this that ties to the language idea is that right now what you have are what I like to refer to as a bunch of container words. Mm -hmm. And container words are words that we use all the time and everybody kind of nods their head, but everybody's got a different definition and nobody really knows what they mean, yeah. right? Yeah. So a lot of the time we hear content and we think lots of different things. Right. We think community, we think lots of different things and we think collaboration and we think lots of different things. True. So what's really, really interesting that you can do with stuff like that is you can open up that container and look at the contents, right? So what you do is you say, if I wasn't allowed to use the word community, mm -hmm. which words would I personally, would I say use? Like which words are important to me that if I was not allowed to use the word community, mm -hmm. I would call it this. Mm. Like I would, would call give, it a tribe, for example. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, like, let's say, let's say tribe gets used a bunch, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use tribe, but you could think about what is a word that goes in front of tribe mm -hmm. or after tribe or tribe of and something, right? Where basically you start to communicate that it's yours, right? Mm -hmm. That it's your intellectual property, it's your ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that a lot of us, like that's the extra step that we don't often take because there's a very good chance that if you did this, I call it the, the language sandbox, right? Mm -hmm. Where basically if you take each of these words, you don't use that word and you say, what are all the different synonyms, you know, words that I could use that kind of fit that or words that remind me of that idea then you have this sandbox of words, right? Like you have this whole big pile of words. And then what you can do is you can basically play Mad Libs mm -hmm. and start putting those words together and you may come up with a new word. You may come up with a new phrase or a new idea and a new way to present things, right? And when you do, that becomes the thing that everybody suddenly decides that they wanna share, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because they're like, yeah, I've heard about, you know, I, I've heard about collaboration, but I've never heard about, uh, you know, content collaboration or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a whole different ballgame when we start to come up with our own language for these things. And that's where a really big opportunity can, you know, can, can sort of come from, right? Mm -hmm. And if you start to think about what you're doing for the clients by basically incorporating these three things, you may start to notice, oh, well, I do far more with these people that is visual, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I, I think about the fact that there are a lot of people podcasting, right? Mm -hmm. And that number has only grown, right? And you have found that this visual component has worked really well for you. That has gotten you a lot of, uh, a lot of views and a lot more attention than just sort of the traditional sort of podcast side of things. Yeah, so live stream is very visual and people love it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And the live stream is collaborative, mm -hmm. right? Right. Because people are watching this right now. They're watching it live. So if they wanted to ask questions or if they wanted to comment or they wanted to talk about it and feel like they were in the room and sort of part of the experience, they would be mm -hmm. right. So if you then look at what your clients are doing and you say, Oh, it looks like there's actually no visual component mm -hmm. to what you're doing. Let's test adding a visual component and see, do you get more opt-ins? Do you get more attention, you know, et cetera. You may start to find, oh, wow, you know, visual, uh, visual components added with content mm -hmm. is one of the things that we need to keep doing or that we need to keep thinking about. And you may end up coming up with new words for that, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. there may be a whole other ways of you, you presenting that information. Yeah. I so want to say, Mr. Roderick, I, I can't <laughs> wait. I, I so, I'm so jealous of people who have been in your English class because I, <laughs> I'm really envious of teachers who are 
so engaging right? i think we've all been there like you are so drawn to like i'm learning something I'm excited about learning not because you're spoon feeding me and forcing me to sit there with you um i i have a follow-up question in terms of uh there's language i i hear a sense of like style as well right um, sure how do I balance between language versus simplicity? Because one of the reasons why we're like, let's get the three P's, let's get the three C's is we want something that rhymes, that's something that people can remember. Um, yep. But I agree with you. Sometimes we fall into the trap of being very generic or unclear even. Um, yeah. So, right. So like, for example, if I were to just break it down, like now my three C's say I change one word for community from community to tribe. Now it's CTC. Obviously, that's not what I'm ending yeah. up with. Is that we are recommending like an umbrella concept and then breaking it down uh, below that, or maybe just scratch, like just break that barrier, break that down and re recreate. Yeah. So you have options, right? I think that that's the biggest thing here is that um, when you are creating new language, in essence, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be testing it anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the time when we're creating thought leadership content and material, we're basically doing market research. We're seeing like which things get a lot of attention, right? Like which things do people pay attention to and say like, oh, I'm going to talk about that more in the future. And in many cases, like we'll forget about some things that we may have talked about on a podcast or, or presented and you know not necessarily think anything of it and then somebody else brings it up and we're like wow i should probably go deeper mm -hmm. into that concept or i should probably dig more into you know into that particular idea so the thing is you want to create like basically uh, a gateway drug if you will um mm -hmm. in terms of the initial idea or the initial content because you want as many people as possible to sort of understand that content, which is why what you could do with the idea of the three C's, if you make that a Venn diagram, a lot of people get the concept of the Venn diagram. It's a very general sort of, you know, sort of thing, right? But then if you were able to say, here is the word for the combination mm -hmm. of community and collaboration, Mm -hmm. then we're already bought in because we've read the diagram and we're like thinking about it. So we're actually open to the innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talk about this in the context of, I've, I've talked about this before, I call it finding your Celine. Um, and there's this really, really great story in Power of Habit about the song Hey Ya by Outkast and the fact that when it first came out, it was turned off almost right away. And like people couldn't listen to it because the sound was just too different, right? It was just kind of weird, like weirdly, like it, it felt like it was like starting in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the chorus. So, so people just like couldn't quite process this like new sound. Mm -hmm. And what the radio stations did was they actually uh, took artists like Celine Dion, who if you've heard a Celine Dion song, you've heard them all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Maroon 5 and a number yeah. of those other artists who have very, very similar sounds, very comfortable sounds for the brain. Right. The brain will just sort of listen all the way through. And what they would do is they would sandwich Hey Ya in the middle. Oh. And after a while, the unfamiliar became familiar. And this oh. is the thing. Most people who are trying to come up with something cool or something interesting from a brand standpoint, they're trying to introduce the world to their Hey Ya, mm -hmm. but they have to find their Celine first. Mm. because people don't trust you yet they don't they like they they're not gonna go like from zero to 90 yeah. right but they will go from zero to 10 and if they're at 10 and you come up with something interesting enough or innovative enough they will go with you to 90 mm -hmm. because they're bought in to that particular you know that particular idea and you know seth godin is a perfect example mm -hmm. because if you go all the way back to the earliest books of seth godin Mm -hmm. They were very, very general concepts at the beginning that were very just like hardcore marketing focused. Yeah. Right. Like mm -hmm. permission marketing is is not esoteric. Like there's nothing, you know, there, there's not like it, it was a very straightforward kind of thing. But once people trusted him yeah. and saw all of that, he was allowed to go in any direction that he wanted to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the buy in was there and people were willing to listen to the innovations. They were willing to listen to the new ideas, to the new concepts. And if you actually watch the trajectory of the books, right, 
they go from being very like straightforward, like here's how to do it, you know, kind of stuff, or here's how to think about it to think for yourself, come up with your, you know, like it it shifted over time to the point where now he basically has more of like a philosopher kind of, you know, kind of vibe, but he didn't start there. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't starting by saying like, here's the philosophy of permission marketing because who would have listened yeah. At that yeah. time. Who's this guy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But now we're like, you know, we're like, oh, you're going to write three words and make me think really, really hard as to why you only wrote three words in a, you know, in a post. <laughs> awesome. Oh, <that's laughs> so amazing. And uh, I know I sent I sent emails to Seth going over once in a while and he does reply and. And it's just incredible sometimes. Yeah. Like three words. He's like, I really need to contemplate. And, and he's right? so meaningful. Um, you know, like I, we, we really, oh my God, we really mean it. And by the way, Mike, I'm keeping you all the way through noon, if that's okay with you. Oh yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting, this is so good. This is incredible. I mean, if you guys want to check out Michael's our origin source, I'll be sure after this to include a link to our previous interview. Um, this is so true about, uh, I think, podcast is this um, vehicle and so is live streaming, so is, you know, blog posts and writing in general. It's just helping people to get to know you. Um, mm-hmm. I recently, I'm not saying as a brag, but I just found this phenomenon. Um, I found out a doctor, psychotherapist has been following uh, my blog, my particular my podcast for four years. Lovely, wow. lovely gentleman. I was like, how, I literally had this moment of like self imposter syndrome. It was like, why would a doctor, you know, working in the jail system, like a serious doctor ever like be interested in my content? And I actually listened to many episodes over the course of four years, reach out to me and said, three C's make sense. I really like what you're doing and we're going to start working together. And I, I said, oh, this is amazing. I said, I really love what you're doing. We had a 20 minute Zoom call. And exactly mm-hmm. like you said, Michael, I sent him a contract, the invoice. I said, we're starting October 1st. He literally Mm -hmm. responded, signed and paid me within five minutes. I'm like, like, you know, you mentioned before of, you know, not convinced, not forcing people. You should really work with me. You should, you should. This is why. (laughs) Look at all the testimonials. My landing page has like a 10,000 words on it. Look at what everybody else like. No, they've, I never, I didn't even know this person. I never pushed them to do anything. So, and he was, he was ready. And it just that, that level of readiness that made me think about the traditional way of many of us think how marketing should work. Like you said, yeah. LinkedIn, every day we get these notifications like, Faye, your website is broken. You should do better. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yep. Know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. All of these types of, you know, all these types of things. Actually, I wrote a, I wrote an email about this a little while back. I called the, the, the bar flies that hang out at the LinkedIn. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, I, I always look at, you know, the, the fact, like, the, like it is, it's like this in, right. And like, we all come and we sort of like share our business stories, right. All these different types of things. And then there are these people who basically just like, I don't know what they do all day, but they just like hang around on instant messenger, sending you messages uh, where they haven't done any research, no. where it's literally, they're, they're asking you to hire them to do something sometimes that you do. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oftentimes you do. Exactly. You you know, and then, yeah. And then other times, you know, they just like, like I got one, I got one where somebody was asking me about my team and office 360. And I'm like, I'm like my team. Well, um, I have a four year old. Uh, a little girl named Juniper, who is very, very good at coming in and uh, pulling wires out. Uh, I have a 10 month old uh, named Diana, who's very, very good at putting things in her mouth. Um, and yeah, they're both very proficient at Microsoft 360. Like, like, oh, man, I just wow. Right. And it's just like, and, and the thing that bothers me sometimes about all of this is the aspect of they were taught to follow up and there's so much technology now that basically makes follow up automatic yeah that you'll get these like follow-ups that are like 
well, I just, uh, I, I guess my thing didn't make it to the top of your inbox, so I'm giving it a bump. Uh, no, it's right. not relevant. It's mm-hmm. not interesting. You did no research. Mm-hmm. You like, you know, and it's just, yeah, it's, uh, but the, the great thing about that for, for people who really have great services and know how to do things mm-hmm. is that the bar, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the bar is low. Yeah. If you want to do cold <laughs> outreach, like if you want to do cold outreach, so many people are doing cold outreach so bad right now, yeah. so bad that you just being genuinely curious and asking somebody like a good question yeah, uh, yeah. is is likely to get a better response. Like, I know. It, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I love the, you know, I, I, oh my God, if you haven't seen this, Michael, there, there's a movie, I believe it's on either Hulu, Netflix, or both called Song of the Sea. And no. oh my God, your little girl, maybe, maybe they're a little too young, actually, especially your little, uh-huh. you know, maybe you and your wife will enjoy it, which is, uh, it's just this animation, but it's not 3D. It's just the most beautifully crafted story about, mm. you know, these two little kids and like mythical characters in, in Ireland. But it's one of those huh. things that, you know, like I, I watched the whole thing and I, I was so, I couldn't look away that day. I had other things planned, but I decided I need to sit here for an hour and a half watch the whole thing. So I emailed the writer and I said, oh my God, this is most incredible. I started describing, I said, I learned about, like you said, it was like, that was probably more research than what he expected. I didn't read a synopsis or anything like that on the website. I, just, I watched every moment of it. Uh, I describe how the, the drawing is so different than Disney and Pixar. And the guy replied immediately, he was like, oh, when, when do we start recording the podcast? And we, we did. And it was just awesome. phenomenal. Yeah, you're right. The bar is so low. So if you're truly yep. interested in someone, please do watch the whatever documentary, listen to a few episodes before you reach out. You might as well get the person you really want and in, invest in that. So um, Michael, it's so rare to have you here. So I'm going to, I mean, it's not rare, but your time is so <laughs> precious. I have a burning question um, that sure, I wrote sure. down from earlier. Okay. Which is, I am helping, uh, I'm working with a doctor, actually more than one uh, recently, but I, this is more of a general thing. I, I know that I lived through cancer with my dad and I know that you mentioned about your mom and um, yeah. both of us are familiar with being a caretaker, being, you know, just on the, I don't want to say the dark side, but the, the healthcare system, the medical system is very... Sure complex and um it's not something you and i you know anybody could be in a situation and be like oh i'm gonna learn this by book and i i will oh, yeah. trust i'll be ready to go so um i've been i'm you know working and really admire a palliative care no, three palliative care doctors one of them is bj miller and one of the struggles that i hear from every single one of them is the term palliative care most people including myself from four years ago like yeah. what's that is that hospice is it end of life care yeah. Um, but yep. the, you know, for people who are watching this, like, what is it? It is the interdisciplinary approach to the quality of life, which means there's so many aspects. If you're overwhelmed with any somewhat serious illness, way before you die, you don't have to die. Uh, even a remission, you can talk to these people and they will help you get, you know, figure that out. Yeah. Here's the thing, Michael, I know that we don't have a ton of time, but with your expertise yeah. in branding, mm-hmm. doctors are all struggling, patients are struggling. What can we do to break it down with language that people can accept and actually understand? Yeah, well, I think it's you have to think about what is what is a term that's actually going to tap into some of that emotion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of along the lines of like, if the medical profession could hold your hand through a process, like that's what palliative care is. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like it's that kind of thing. Like you want to, you want to help people understand a lot of the time a metaphor uh, is a very, very good tool to help people understand a process and they will ask you more details if they need more details. But for some people just giving them a metaphor can completely just like make it clear to them. Mm-hmm. And they'll be, you know, and they'll be fine. So a lot of the time when things are like overly complex, it's best to think about, is there a metaphor? Is there an image that you can give people that causes them to say, okay, this is what this is. You know, this is what this is about. Mm -hmm. This is how this, you know, this is how this works. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, people will ask the additional follow-up questions if they need clarification. But most of the time, 
people will say like when you say stuff like that like people will just be like okay yeah i get it mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. like okay yes i you know I, I i get it so the the most effective sentence i say whenever i am talking to a potential client mm-hmm. is that nine times out of ten people who are really really good at what they do deprioritize packaging their intellectual property mm-hmm. they die with their song inside them you know mm-hmm. that kind of you know that kind of concept right yeah, yeah. so the work that i do is about le- getting them to sit down and say like how do i package my ideas how do i turn this into thought leadership how do i turn this into a business or you know all mm-hmm. those different types of things but if I opened with, I'm going to turn you into a thought leader, I'm going to help you change your, you know, your concepts, it wouldn't work, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. But Mm -hmm. if I say, most people deprioritize packaging their intellectual property, Mm -hmm. then if that's you, you instantly have this like gut punch Mm -hmm. that says, wow, I haven't done that. Like, I haven't put my stuff together. Mm -hmm. So in the context of what you're talking about, you could very easily say something along the lines of most people who are going through a very, very difficult time, you know, like cancer with a loved one have families hands to hold, but they don't have a hand to hold in the medical profession. The medical profession feels cold. It feels like it's not really helping them at all. Mm -hmm. And palliative care is like having that hand extended to you from people in the medical profession, people who won't like talk, you know, Uh, numbers and and charts at you people who will tell you exactly what you need Mm -hmm. to have a better experience so that you're not blind when it comes to all of the jargon frankly that Mm -hmm. is part of the the world of medicine yeah no that that is brilliant and I think to you triggered all these thoughts, which I find that will then I can you started this matlib that I continue to continue and and also and this and you know to look at my own situation like my dad was put on a lot of clinical trials in retrospect the doctors some of the doctors were kind enough to say that probably won't work and it's up to you if you want to spend six hundred dollars a day in addition to the medication that you're already paying for. And of course, my mom and I were ready to bankrupt the entire family and just go ahead and do that. But there was not a second voice to say, maybe there are other routes. What is that your dad really want? Um, You know, my dad unfortunately passed away at the ICU like so many other people that, you know, if I had the slightest knowledge and language I can use to talk to people in my culture, this was happening in China. So very different than here. So, you know, the palliative care doctors, the people I had the privilege to interview on my show, Jessica Zitter, Vicky Jackson, BJ Miller, they give you that language. They will write down, literally your walk away with all these notes to say, this is how you go talk to your oncologist. This is how you talk to your primary care. I mean, not even a, a serious cancer, you know, even something that's non-life threatening. That would have, yeah. I don't I don't know how much money I'm with. That, that is something money can buy. And yeah. um, thank you so much, Michael. I mean, that was just so incredible. Um, you, you did bring up a second thought. That's very true. Sure deprioritizing intellectual property. Why do people do that? Like busyness, yeah. lack of clarity? Yeah. What can you uh, do? I, th- I think what it ultimately comes down to is uh, there, I think there's two things. I think the first thing is that it's very, very easy to get lost in helping everybody else. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. a very, very easy thing. It's a very, very natural thing um, because when we're helping other people, we get the reward of feeling proficient. Mm-hmm. right like if i help you and you succeed in something there is a there is a reward that i'm getting when i watch you succeed yeah when you're trying to sit there and come up with your own stuff there's no reward there mm, yeah there's yeah. no like you know oh i i've solved it because you're basically just creating something that you're going to be testing yeah. and sort of putting out into the market right Mm -hmm. so so the aspect of doing that work it doesn't have the same it doesn't have the same appeal as doing the client work Mm -hmm. you know just like for many people um having a conversation with somebody doesn't have has infinitely more appeal than them sitting down and writing down what their ideas are right 
right? And coming up with their own thing and having a conversation with themselves instead of an individual, <laughs> it's very right? Scary. Yeah. Like very, very scary kind of process. Yeah. Um, but then the second thing is that we are, we're wired to be safe, mm-hmm. right? Our brains have always been wired to be safe. And the second that we decide that we're going to put our ideas out there, we are opening ourselves up to criticism. And we're opening ourselves up to people not agreeing with us. And we're opening ourselves up to all sorts of, you know, challenges. So a lot of people worry about that. And they do what I like to refer to as polishing the car, but never driving. Where basically you spend all your time trying to perfect something. And then you never get it out the door. Mm -hmm, And the way that I handle this and and what I think works best uh, is giving yourself permission to suck. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what that comes down to is you can't be consistent and brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen. Like some things are going to be good and some things are going to be okay. And some things are going to be really bad. Like, Mm -hmm. so if you accept that and you just say, I give myself permission to suck, I give myself permission to create things that don't actually work, that aren't any good, you know, et cetera. And I'm not going to worry about how people react to it, et cetera, because I'm showing up and I'm doing things Mm -hmm. right and you treat your work as market research, like you treat every failure not as a failure, but as new information, then it's gonna be much, much easier to sort of move, you know, move through it. I, I, I refer to it as the tennis novice versus the tennis pro approach. Tennis novice misses a shot, game is over because they're in their head, they're just gonna be all messed up. Tennis pro misses a shot and says, what can I learn? Yeah. What has this taught me? And then even if they lose the game, they're still thinking about how they can play in the future and all those different types of things. So tennis novice is a slave to the product. A tennis pro is a student of the process. You make yourself a student of the process instead of a slave to the product, you can get a lot of content out there. You can get a lot of things happening. Oh, I love that, man. I was like busy writing things down. I'll get a transcript for this. Um, (laughs) This is so wonderful, Michael. What? Um, what do you do for your clients? You know, there are links in down below. I'm posting those everywhere. Uh, people sure. know how to connect with you, but if they want to learn from you directly, how do they find you? And, and sure. Um, you? well, you know, I'm on the book of faces, so you've probably seen me tagged on there. So of course say hello there. Um, and I will get you uh, Faye, I've got a, uh, referability reader that I've been working on. Um, so you would actually be the first person to get it. Uh, so I'll oh, post it. Um, uh, awesome. yeah, so, so I'll post that. And um, basically, it will help you kind of look at your own referability. And then uh, people can reach out to me at the LinkedIn. If they mention this show, um, obviously, I'll be much more open to having conversations, um, you know, yes. all those different types of things, but always happy to help. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, the work that I do is if you're really interested in packaging your ideas and mm-hmm. getting your stuff out there, uh, I can help you think through that process and develop business models around it, uh, you know, frameworks, things like that. Oh, this is wonderful. I literally just, the link of referability Raider uh, opt-in is in the description everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are on Facebook and YouTube. So definitely subscribe. I just did and I can't wait to see what comes of it. And I want to just give a shout out to Michael's daily email newsletter. You know, Thank it's... You. Uh, absolutely you are the i would say the second person i mean other than seth godin who does this i you know people kind of start and stop but you continued over the years and long form content on your social media walls and it's just so inspiring i cannot say enough about how important that is is like that thank you yeah the the thought that, that you know the energy that you put in there so definitely very very worth uh learning if after this interview you're still making up your mind come on so you know definitely <laughs> so much to learn from michael and i love seeing comments people are like this is amazing that makes me so oh, happy. i'm so glad <laughs> uh, yeah. thank you so much Faye. i really appreciate it as always michael so i'm gonna say take us off live right now yeah. and uh thank you so much guys for watching we're gonna stop